Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I am America Paredes. I am the Associate Vice President for Partnerships and Community Outreach here at MHA. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am so glad to be with you today. Um, I am very pleased to be moderating our next segment and discussing the mental health impacts of COVID on underserved populations. Our next guest is an expert in this topic, and I am so pleased to have her here with me. Uh, Dr. Luz Maria Garcini is the Assistant Professor at the Center for Research to Advance Community Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, and a faculty scholar at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. The primary goal of her research is to inform policy and best practices among providers, as well as to develop and disseminate interventions for individuals and families facing adversity. Dr. Garcini, un placer tenerlo con nosotros hoy día. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to dive right in because this topic is something that is so important to discuss, and I want to be able to have as much time as possible to chat with you. So, Dr. Garcini, welcome. Hola, America. ¿Cómo estás? Thank you very much for giving us the space to talk about, like you just mentioned, this important topic. Y exactamente. Uh, hoy día estoy tan contenta de tenerle con nosotros. I'm so happy to have you here, not only because of the work that you're doing, but because of what it means to have individuals like yourself doing this important work and be representative of individuals who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, so I'm going to dive right into our conversation. Uh, so tell us, Dr. Garcini, a little bit about the work that you are doing. Yes. So uh, particularly focused on COVID, uh, one of the things that we've tried to reach out and figure out is how is the current environment affecting the mental health and the well-being at all different levels, physically, mentally, and spiritual, of underserved communities? Um, such as the Latino community across the U.S.-Mexico border. You know, we, we also have other uh, underserved populations, such as our uh, Black communities that are also struggling. We have Native uh, American communities that have also, um, you know, experienced a lot of the uncertainty that has come with the unprecedented times. So in trying to find out what are uh, some of these mental health stressors, we can develop a better understanding as to how do we prepare uh, to fight the, the COVID pandemic now and beyond. And as well as to understand how these mental health concerns can affect other uh, behaviors, such as those that involve prevention efforts, like engaging in testing for COVID-19, engaging in the use of protective measures, even when one becomes available, what is, how is this going to impact the use of vaccinations um, and things of that sort? That's very powerful. And, you know, when you think about the impacts across all of these communities, uh, one of the things I think that really sticks out is the unprecedented need that exists for addressing the mental health, which many communities often don't talk about these issues, right? So with the pandemic, we've had to face the impacts of it without really understanding that it was coming. We at MHA knew it was coming, but the general public may not have really understood that. And what we value in the work that you're doing is helping others understand it's not just because of the pandemic, right? The pandemic has exacerbated these issues, but tell us a little bit about what you have found around the mental health issues related to the pandemic and just broadly. Absolutely. So one thing that is important to emphasize is that the United States has experienced a mental health crisis uh, for a very long time. We see high rates of anxiety, depression, suicidal, uh, you know, suicidal ideation has been on the rise for some time now. So I think the, the current pandemic is a compounded stressor that is magnifying problems that we were already seeing. Um, that combined with the current sociopolitical context in which there is a lot of confusion, where the rhetoric uh, that is being used, that is being targeted to attack minority populations is, is causing a lot of mistrust in our communities and anxiety and fear. Um, so we're seeing a lot of civil unrest, uh, you know, that is affecting a lot of the Black communities and everybody. Um, so I, I think it's a lot of stressors combined at a moment when it's difficult 
uh, to access services in the traditional way. And of course, you know, for our populations, it's always been traditionally difficult to access services and most importantly, to find services that are tailored to meet their specific needs. You know, we need cultural and context adaptations to treatments to better meet the, the needs of our peoples. And many times they're not there. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I that I value around the work that you've done, particularly around undocumented communities and something that's heightened because of the pandemic and the social political context in which we're living is is the fear that is associated um, with getting assistance. And what have you found relevant to that in your work? Yes, it's I, I think that is a top concern that has come out in uh, in the focus groups and research that we've been doing. There is widespread fear in the immigrant community. And it extends beyond the undocumented community. You know, we hear a lot of uh, legal resident families who are concerned of even seeking services because they don't know how those records are gonna be used in the future and compromise their immigration legal status. So the distrust um, that permeates in our communities with the fear, their fear that you know if they diagnose positive with COVID-19, they're gonna be separated from their families. And then, I mean, we all of us have seen the pictures of families being separated at the border and children in cage, but I think, now it has escalated to a level that even if you have a uh, legal status, you don't trust, you know, people are afraid and we're passing this to our children. So there is, there is a lot of fear, anxiety and, and distrust that is affecting our community. Our, our screening data has definitely shown that, you know, an increase in both depression and anxiety. But one of the things that I think that is very relevant to this discussion is this, un it's not unfounded, right? The fear that individuals have in accessing services because um, there is information out there that says if you do go access services, something may happen. And that in many ways relates to the trauma that individuals may have experienced prior to coming to the United States during the migration process and the post-migration process, right? Where they're just trying to figure out what they can do to improve their lives um, and at the same time being traumatized. And recently, you know, the death of George Floyd and the unrest that has happened from that also is another trigger to all the trauma that individuals may have experienced, both as immigrants, undocumented and underserved populations. What about um, you know, the trauma aspect of all of this? What does your work and your research tell you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have seen that there's a, definitely a high amount of trauma uh, that is embedded in underserved communities. Um, you know, and, and we know that in order to be able to address or treat trauma, the first step is to give people a sense of safety. You cannot treat trauma unless people feel safe. And unfortunately, within the current context, you know, due to the pandemic, and again, due to the current civil unrest and sociopolitical environment that we're seeing, um, that seems far from reality. So how do we address or how to even avoid or train people not to re-traumatize individuals when they seek services? Because it is as simple as even a, a tone of voice that might trigger a trauma memory, right? It, it's a, the tone, the intonation, the way in which people treat you. Discrimination is being found to be a huge trigger uh, for people with past histories of trauma. So I think we need to start uh, being aware of what is going to be the long-term consequences of this potential exposure to uh, re-traumatization in a context where services are limited. And what is it that we can do to better prepare ourselves uh, to address these issues? The other important thing uh, to mention is that trauma in minority communities might not necessarily present in the same way as we traditionally contextualize, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you know, there are different ways in which symptoms might present. So it might be in the form of overactivity. You know, it might be in the form of, um, you know, uh, depersonalization, obsessive compulsive thoughts. 
you know, they might not report functional impairment because at this point, you know, engaging and overworking might be the way to distract yourself from having to experience that trauma. So how are we going to account for those experiences of trauma in these marginalized communities is essential. And we need to move to make that possible uh, to avoid the consequences of it. You speak to so many issues that are so important that I would love to just have a conversation with you that could last hours. But one of the things that you said is very relevant to this conversation in that, you know, the way in which our communities, um, underserved communities and black, indigenous and people of color communicate around the issues that we experience may be very different than what is recognized in the westernized medical model of illness, right? So where we have um, a post-traumatic stress screener or an anxiety screener, and th the reality is that our communities may not actually present those symptoms. And it really requires the professionals working with individuals across sectors, not just in the behavioral health community, um, to ask very relevant questions around their cultural mm -hmm. context and the nuances may come to fruition, right? Will we'll naturally rise if the individual is very willing to share what their experiences have been. Um, you also touched a little bit around this, this fact that many individuals are not necessarily, one, they're not presenting in the same way, but also do you think that something that has happened in communities is that we have found ways to address these issues amongst ourselves, um, among mm -hmm. trusted partners. And I think that's something that speaks to the resiliency of our communities. Uh, which oftentimes is not spoken about, right? It's the vitriol is all negative, um, and we and we at MHA and really believe in the fact that we also have to highlight the positive. And could you speak a little bit about that in your experience and your work? Absolutely. One of the most fascinating things that I have uh, found in my research with the undocumented community and a lot of underserved communities is the strength and the resilience that comes, that even in the face of multiple and chronic trauma, they continue to be resilient and they continue to even report that life is not as bad. Uh, you know, so there is a lot that we need to learn. And I think that there's also, it's so important how you mentioned that we need to address that because maybe a lot of the times our treatments need to address strength-based approaches that maybe we stop uh, stigmatizing people and looking at them from a psychopathology perspective, but why not explode those strength-based approaches to make them stronger and, and come up? You know, they're extremely resilient in the way they use their own community resources, in the way they build their own support groups, their own information networks. So what is it that we can bring to these communities to strengthen from within, given the limited access to services that they have, so that we can start using their optimism, their creativity, you know, their ability to connect with their ancestral or with their cultural pride to regain a sense of strength, a sense of self-identity that can keep them moving forward. It completely. Uh, you know, during the month of July, uh, we, we focused a lot around the issues um, connected to Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And one of the things that we did was have an Instagram live with Dr. Cesar Cruz, who spoke to us about intergenerational wisdom, right? And looking at the power that exists in the people that have come before us um, to find strength. And I think that is something that is often overlooked in our communities. You know, um, Many institutions may not realize um, that, yes, funding is necessary to get all these things into place and to assist people. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. But I also believe that when we go out into communities and tell people, well, you have to show us outcomes within six months, and it's, that's not the way our communities work, and giving yourself an outcome that is quantifiable, right, is very different than me being able to say, I actually had a one hour conversation with this person and she walked away feeling better, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like for you to speak a little bit about that strength-based kind of approach and what that could kind of look like. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think this is where we go back and And I mean, medicine is doing it, right? They're moving to individualized medicine where we need to understand that what works for one individual might not work for another one, you know? And yes, evidence-based practices is important, but we also need to think about that a lot of evidence-based practice was not developed with these hidden or hard to reach populations in mind. So how do we start learning from them, right? Even when, when we talk about symptoms of distress, I think in some of this interaction, we need to ask them, what are your symptoms of the stress? Because the symptoms of the stress that might manifest in this community might be very different to those symptoms of the stress that might manifest for another community. Same with triggers, triggers for the stress crisis. You know, what are some of those triggers for a particular community are gonna be very different to those that are for other communities. So we need to start thinking about it in, in outside the box, you know, and carve away first with humbleness to learn about what this community needs. Uh, I think these communities has been marginalized and discriminated for so long that we need to go back to our basics of what Dr. Carl Rogers showed us, um, which is unconditional positive regard. The power of listening to people with a full heart, the power of not judging, the power of working collaborative. Uh, you know, in the previous session that was presented um, today in your conference, I heard about the importance of uh, addressing collectivistic attitudes. How do we work together to get out of this? And I think that is the approach that we can take when we start thinking about strength-based approaches, being the best of you so that I can bring the best of me and we can work together to figure out a solution. That's very powerful. Uh... I think sometimes people forget that we do have the ability to work in that way um, because we oftentimes are siloed, right? And we forget that we should be reaching out to partners and other organizations that may be already working with these communities, maybe are more representative of these communities than we are, right? Instead of just saying, we're the ones that have the answers and looking to them to help guide us through these efforts. So do you have any specific recommendations of what individuals and organizations can really do to kind of delve more into this space and be more proactive around addressing the needs of underserved communities? Absolutely, thank you for that beautiful question, first of all. And uh, it is important to emphasize that everybody has a platform in which they can make a difference. So you don't need to have a leading position, you know, at a organization or at a hospital, or everybody can make a difference to the current environment that we're living in. Whether as head of household, right? If you're the head of household, make sure that your family knows about who these populations are. Make sure that they learn to treat people with respect. Um, you know, that make sure to learn what good and bad rhetoric means and what are some of those core values that we want to pass on to generations. If you're in academia, make sure that you make your contribution to train future providers, scientists, and leaders that will head the way in a way that we gain back this uh, beautiful multicultural society that the United States have, have known for so long, and that right now it seems like it's, it's under threat, and there's so much divisiveness around it. You know, if you're in a hospital in healthcare, what can you do for the provision of services that can better tailor the needs of everybody, especially of those left behind? What, what can we do? Who can you collaborate with? Um, you know, there's a lot of no beautiful, fantastic nonprofit organizations that people can join. Uh, even if you don't have the expertise, volunteer in some of these organizations, learn about the people learn about uh, people that are different to yourself um, with curiosity and with a way of wanting to find out how to work together to grow together. So there's definitely a lot that people can do. And I think in that process, um, you know, we can work together, grow together and get out of the current situation that we're in. 
it what what really brings to your conversation and what you're talking about it, you know what i automatically automatically kind of think about is in communities that are oftentimes seen as underserved or marginalized uh, we oftentimes have individuals who are natural born leaders and they've taken on those positions without ever really recognizing that they've become those people, right? Where you have the grandmothers or las abuelitas and the tias and the aunties that are the ones that are gatekeepers to these communities and are also the ones that are really putting information in front of folks to say, these are the things that are relevant to you. And too often those people are not, they're, they're forgotten, right? And for us, and I speak for myself specifically, right, as a Latinx person, collectively, my community is not just my immediate family, right? It's my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, people that I don't even know because we're just naturally connected to one another. And if there's an opportunity, I think, to engage with people like ourselves, um, it also brings a genuine kind of point to the conversation, right? It is not about other people coming into our communities and saying, these are the things that are gonna make you better. Instead, mm -hmm. it's about saying, I am coming here because I feel like I can help, help me help you, help me figure out what that means and what that looks like, right? And yeah. you speak to that with all of the things that you've mentioned, right? Individually, when you're working at institutions, I think oftentimes people forget that there is power in our ability as individuals to push for change. And mm -hmm. on the toughest days, we sometimes forget that. But on the best days, we have to remember that, right? And embrace that. And I think your work really speaks to that and the work of your colleagues, because I know it's a collective you know, contribution that is being made. Um, I wanted to ask you one other one other question around the work that you are doing. Uh, you spoke a little bit about undocumented populations and underserved populations in general. But one of the things that has come to come to bear with all of the things happening with with the pandemic is the fact that in our communities we oftentimes have difficulties asking for help, right? And is there a way that we can help navigate? or help individuals navigate how to ask for help? And have you found something like that relevant in your work? Absolutely. Another super important thing to address in our communities, particularly, and this is particularly relevant when we talk about gender roles, right? For example, in the Latinx community, you know, when um, the idea of machismo, when men are supposed to be tough and not seek for help, and particularly now they're the protectors of the families, you know, or moms, you know, they keep working and seem like everything is fine when they're, you know, they're struggling between kids and in school and, and, and worrying about their husbands. So definitely, I think the way to approach this, I would say from a collectivistic perspective is that you need to take care of yourself because if you're okay, the people that you love will be okay. So take care of yourself, seek help so that you can be the best version of yourself to help those that you love the most. Um, you know, I, I do believe that it's hard to power when the cup is empty. And, um, you know, we need to go away that, that looking for help is a sign of weakness. I would say it's the opposite. Like looking and seeking out help is a sign of strength. It's a step forward in wanting to be the best version of yourself, wanting to have and regain the best life that you're here to have. So if we can shift that focus as to why is it important to seek help, we can also fight the stigma that surrounds mental health treatment um, in the way that we all need it. You know, I always say to, to clients or to people when they come, it might not be the, for you, but you have nothing to lose and you have a lot to gain. So just give it a try. You know, there's always new life skills that you can learn. And um, it's important also that you can serve as a role model for seeking help. And you really never know whose life you might even save by being that role model that say, I sought help and I'm fine now. There is treatment. We have treatments for depression, treatments for anxiety that work. Um, you know, so treatments for interpartner violence that work. So in being that role model, you can invite people 
to also lead the way and to seek help and you might save lives. So it's absolutely, uh, but I think we need to rethink in the way in which we invite people to seek help. I agree completely. Um, we have several questions that have come through our chat. So I am going to pivot to that so we have an opportunity to hear from you. Um, the first one is from the Black Autist and they ask, does the fear of getting info passed to law enforcement also contribute to fear of people in marginalized communities seeking mental health resources? Absolutely. Anytime you have to disclose any source of personal information, people are terrified. They don't know what's going to happen with their information. Uh, they don't know how their information is going to be used. And they don't know what that information can do in the future. I mean, we have this with, unfortunately, uh, I do some work with the DACA community, the DACA recipients, if you're not familiar with them, they're uh, young adults who were brought to the United States as children by their parents and who have a temporary protective status and the protective status has been threatened to be taken away. But they, when they were undocumented, they came forward with all of their information. And now that's a, their biggest fear is like, well, they know where we are, they know our families, you know. Um, if something were to happen, I could easily be deported. So there is definitely a fear that permeates in seeking services, even to the point to, of that is life-threatening because many people won't even go to the ER. I mean, they can be having a heart attack and just the fear of going there and disclosing their status and giving their information will prevent them from going. And we've known cases of people who have passed as a result of not seeking health services. I know too that there has been data recently that has um, highlighted the fact that individuals may not have sought um, assistance for COVID related kind of symptoms because of that fear. Yeah, absolutely. And that involves also not engaging in contact tracing, right? Which is essential to protect our families and to protect ourselves because you have to provide the information. Imagine even let's say for someone who has a temporary or even a legal permanent status, the fact that they have to give out the names of people who have been in contact with and who are families who might be an undocumented, you know, it must be a very, very difficult decision. So people don't want to disclose. You know, the identification is required. Many undocumented immigrants don't have driver's license, uh, you know, or any source of identification. To get a COVID test, you're required to have an identification. So it's definitely getting in the way of, uh, of trying to mitigate the current health crisis that we're living. Definitely. And, and it speaks to some of the systemic issues, right, that exist in, in our communities where we have not really thought about um, easing access to all of these services, but instead have created additional barriers. Um, but that's a whole different yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, and I think that another thing that is important to emphasize is that you emphasize a lot of the seeking access to services. These communities have been labeled essential. You know, we see a lot of marginalized and underserved communities who are providing the essential workforce, right? Who are at the forefront of building services, you know, of, of working at stores, but at the same time, they're not essential when it's about seeking services. So how can we do to, to clear that gap and not to harm our communities because our communities feel betrayed and used? Definitely. I mean, you see that currently with the current crisis, you know, with migrant, migrant farm workers that are still in the fields, um, providing all of us with the food that we eat, right? Um, and they're still working amidst fire, um, rain, storms, it doesn't matter, right? They're still working. And oftentimes their, their health needs are forgotten. Um, I also have another question from somebody else. Uh, Marcy Timmerman asked, what are some non-traditional ways we can bring mental health education and self-help to immigrant communities since racism, xenophobia, and public charge are very real and valid concerns? Wonderful question. Um, I would say the first is to look for sources in the community that are trusted. And in that regard, faith-based organizations are leading the way. I mean, our communities trust them, so, you know, 
training people who can work. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of our pastors and our priests and our faith-based leaders are overwhelmed. And sometimes they say, we need the training. We don't have enough training for to deal with more severe cases or to deal with the volume of concerns. So how can the mental health field work with these organizations, uh, with nonprofit community centers to deliver this information and these services to the community that they trust? The other aspect that is important is to start um, working with community health workers or promotoras or promotores. So these are trusted members in the community that bring out health information. They're trained within the medical model or the mental health model to bring out services. Unfortunately, the limiting barrier that we have there is funding. A lot of times there's no funding for these programs and then they die or community health workers are overburdened and over, overloaded with work because the community see them as trusted members um, that do a lot of work with very little. They go to them. So it is important that we start thinking in this way or America, as you mentioned before, right? Start equipping our communities to build their own support systems. How can we teach them? It's almost like train the trainer model and bring our skills to them so that members of the community can be trained to help each other in times of need. Yeah, the, you know, what you speak to around the funding issue, I think is very important because many of, of the folks that may be watching today are also working in advocacy and policy related efforts. So identifying organizations that are working in this um, kind of framework and then going to them and asking how the funding is implemented and then integrating requests for this type of funding into future kind of efforts, I think is also very relevant, right? Um, instead of just simply focusing on what you know is there. Uh, you really have to dig a little deeper, I think, for many folks to identify the resources in the community that are there, because they are there. They just might not be on a billboard for you to see, right? Um, another question that has come up from Jessica Pina, uh, or Pina, how would you advise folks to address the complexities of trauma especially among marginalized communities, particularly in, in a school setting where they are in spaces that traumatize them daily? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent question. And I think it goes back to uh, training, for example, in school systems, right? Training the teachers. And unfortunately, right now, you know, we have a lot of that has transitioned with uh, doing everything through the computer. But there's ways in which we can train people to look at the behavioral symptoms of trauma. You can see in the way people use the behavioral cues, the way they, they engage in eye contact, you know, the way in which they respond to a command, the way in which they interact with other children. So I would say the key is first training, training teachers, training providers to first identify potential signs, to second, assess if the trauma is present, which is essential to create a sense of safety because then you immediately start moving to putting that person into a safe, um, safe environment. And then how do we go about trying to figure out how to do the best that we can to provide trauma treatment in environments that are not safe so that the person can continue to cope and find some, some help in the midst of the, the adversity that they continue to be embedded in. One of the things um, that when, in what you're saying kind of makes me take pause for a moment is the fact that um, in some of the research that I've done, it has been demonstrated that individuals who have uh, higher rates of acculturation, right, have lived here in the United States for much longer periods of time compared to their children may have some, it may come to exhibit some interdictional conflicts because the child is trying to adapt and more easily oftentimes adapts to the American culture compared to their parents. And when you, you know, kind of push that into the realm of school, that can be very difficult to kind of manage. And I think it, it's something that maybe is relevant to the discussion. Do you, do you have any thoughts around that particularly? Oh, absolutely. This is something, and uh, you know, the best example that I have also found that is uh, in my research is with DACA recipients and their families. Uh, you know, where we have 
kids that came to the United States and became immediately acculturated. Many of them speak English much better than they speak Spanish. And some of their parents don't even speak English, right? So they become, these children, a lot of the times become the culture navigators for the entire family. So they really never have a time to be children. They start having responsibilities of being navigators and bridges to their communities and advocates to their families since very young. There's a big responsibility. You know, uh, some of the feedback that they give is like they feel this leave, this this double life that for example when they're in school they already thinking about the responsibilities they have at home but they kind of have to fake you know and live in this in this less mature environment and when they home they have to take charge so um it's very stressful and it's very tiring for them and I think over time, uh, we can see the concept, the negative consequences and impact that that's gonna have, not only on the mental health, but if we look at the research on biology now, the long-term effects uh, of this type of stress on the health system, the development of chronic illnesses, such as cardiovascular disease, high risk of trauma. And now with epigenetics, we know that there might be a risk to pass on to future generations as well. So I think we need to be careful and pay a lot of attention as to what these dynamics are having, how they're impacting the way in which families from different generations interact, and how can we create better environments at work, at home, and within our, our organizations so that we can give them some rest. Definitely. Um, somebody asked asked a very relevant question too, and that they asked, "How do teachers get the support they need?" Some teachers have reported trauma or abuse in the home, and yet our laws do not protect youth. Some teachers struggle with that. So, what would your recommendation be for teachers that are kind of struggling through that? Yes, I I'm not a I don't do child psychology or or school psychology, so I feel very limited in terms of giving my recommendations as to what teachers can do specifically. Uh, but I would say the first step is going to advocate probably to their offices for that type of training, for that type of resources. Everything begins with awareness, right? I, I've always believed that anything that can be measured can be managed. So all take notes of everything that they notice in their classrooms, of, uh, of things that they need and report back and say, we need this, you know, organize among yourself to claim for your training needs to say, we have this problem without your eyes and without your knowledge, we can't do much. So we need to have that voice that represent those students and that represent the needs of teachers to be able to develop interventions and treatments. Or, you know, look for nonprofit agencies in the area of education and bring your concerns and highlight those areas that are dark that we might need to develop resources. That, that's very good. Um, one of the things I know that is relevant for our work, we just released our back to school toolkit that is uh, focused around coping with COVID, but it's not only relevant for youth, but it's also relevant for parents and teachers. And, you know, teachers are fundamental in the development of our, in, in the development of our kids in our communities. And I think oftentimes they are forgotten, right? We know they're there, but their needs are not addressed as often. Um, so I would I would also recommend that you know teachers really focus on reaching out to some of the leaders in the field, whether maybe it's engaging with the National School Boards Association, figuring out what that would look like, or the PTA mm -hmm. um, and the unions. Right, unions have a lot of power, and they're fundamental in the way that things can get done. Um, I want to make sure that I'm very mindful of time, so I'm going to ask a couple of more questions. Um, somebody has asked, uh, Jay Reynoso asked, how do you identify safe haven organizations in a super politicized environment? Most religious organizations now are aligned with the current government mentally of labeling people as bad folks. Yes, absolutely. You have to do a lot of work behind that. You know, I would say the first thing is to read some of the materials that they have published, read their mission and their vision. 
have a call with their officials. You will see um, or you will hear the rhetoric, you know, look up for now we have the, the blessing of having technology, right? So watch out some of the YouTube videos that they have put out and, and go with your, with your God instinct. Usually you can, you can hear when they're speaking to your heart and you can hear when if there's something that is not appropriate but i will say unfortunately a lot of the work is going to have to be done by the consumer but there are some excellent um, uh, immigrant organizations um, you, another key aspect to know between what is a, a good organization to, to volunteer or work with is look at the resources what create. What are the deliverables that that organization has? If it's an organization that just asks for donations, I would say I will have my questions about it. But look, are there tangible deliverables, whether it's educational materials, whether it's educational videos, whether it's organ uh, fairs, health fairs, or campaigns, or organized activities that they have put out. If they have deliverables that has served your community and that you feel that it is helping their needs, then I would say it's worth looking into it. But I would say look at the deliverables first. Thank you. Um, I am going to ask one final question and then just um, chat with you for a moment is what can I do for people of color in predominantly white communities? What kinds of safety or services can I provide? That's from Sarah Beth Lowe. Yes, beautiful question. I think that to get out of the environment that we're in, we need to look beyond color and start, um, you know, learning, having that willingness to learn from each other. There's nothing more beautiful. I mean, when we look at our school systems, right? There's a lot of the times when we see a white kid, a black kid and a Latinx kid, Native American kid playing together. So how does that happen? Why can't we do that at adult level and learn? You know, so I think working together and showing that desire of learning from each other, right? Creating opportunities for dialogue. Um, we have heard so much divisiveness and attacks. You know, we see it in the media all the time. We see it in, in even our own organizations and meetings. So how, instead of that, how can we create dialogue in, um, in, color, in, in communities where maybe minority people, um, you know, could feel more welcome to come and express why they think and, and work together solutions. Um, you know, I can tell you, I work with students of all different colors, and it's so rewarding to see when, when there's a collaborative effort uh, that transcends the color of skin and that works for the common good of how do we create a better society that we all move together and learn from each other. Those, I think, are so valuable valuable kind of thinkings that we have to then focus on, right, when we do our work on a daily basis. Um, Dr. Garcini, we're almost out of time. Do you have a final thought that you would like to share with folks? Yes, absolutely. So uh, first of all, America, thank you. You know, you and I do very similar work. So thank you uh, to Mental Health America for giving the space to this important topic uh, and to be to be open for the discussion. I invite everybody, everybody can make a difference right now. Um, you know, help people learn about each other, try to fight stereotypes, help find ways to create peace and let's stop dividing ourselves. You know, we need to be stronger than ever um, to fight this thing that we're living with. And let's all work together to end up mental health stigma because I do believe that um, there are treatments out there that can provide better mental, better, better life if we're just open to learning. Thank you, Dr. Garcini. Uh, it has been a wonderful, wonderful time to, for me to just chat with you. And I know everybody that's watching is also going to take this information and see how they can implement it in their communities. Gracias por todo su trabajo. Thank you for all your work and the continued efforts that you're going to do. Um, our time has ended but we will be connected again in the future. Thank you all for watching. We're gonna be right back in a few minutes.